you know that there's no fire drill uh, uh, plans for during these meetings. And if you hear the fire drill down the stairs and out of the building safely, don't use the um, lifts and use the back of the, the uh, fire exit via the door in the back of the building as usual. So we've got nobody, no, we've got no, um, nobody in the public gallery. So on to the minutes. Can we say the true reflection of the minutes? Okay. Uh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't at the meeting, but I'm just reading over the minutes. It says on page, or what is it? What is page that is page four or eight? It doesn't. It. <laughs> page, the page numbers are all double written over with numbers, so it's, it's the second, fourth page. The fourth page of the minutes does. Second line down, it says three million funding for for the uh, buses, but for the buses from the Department of Transport, I think it's three billion. So it might be worth just checking that, Paul, for accuracy. Accuracy, uh, that's the only thing. Is everybody else happy? Yeah. While we're doing that, Chairman, for the sake of the record, we've got Councillor uh, Michael Lilly in place of uh, Councillor Joe Lever tonight. Thank you, Councillor Lilly. Uh, declarations of interest. Councillor Medlin. Sorry about this, but uh, yeah, I've just got one to make. It's on point eight on the agenda about the deployment of electric vehicles. As I'm actually involved with developing policy, I want to declare an interest. It's not a pecuniary or personal interest, but it's sufficient to be of an interest to, as we're a scrutiny committee, I will not take part in, the, in that debate. Okay. It's a non pecuniary interest. Anybody else? Um, public questions. Um, there's nobody up there, but no, have we, we had any? None no, of those no questions. Chairman. Okay, on to uh, number four. So the progress on outcomes from previous meetings. Has anybody got any anything they want to say on that one? It is normally there for just noting members so yeah. you can see that progress has been made or where no progress has been made, we will follow that up after this meeting. I mean, I've checked this today, so I think it's okay, but Councillor Quirk? Councillor Quirk. Uh, yes, uh, details of the proposed tenancy training will be circulated to the committee uh, by the Assistant Director of Regeneration Housing. Uh, it says it, to be circulated. Has it? When? We've not had it yet, and that's why uh, it's still okay. to be started. Can, can a, a reminder to go out to have yeah, that circulated? We will do, yes. I thought maybe I've missed it. <laughs> so we'd like to know when that's. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, we, we will get to see it, yeah. but yeah, I'll find out when. It's being portrayed as an important sort of plank of the policy is uh, you know, delivering this. So I, I think it's uh, if it's important, it should be coming out sooner rather than later, hopefully. OK, I've made a note of that. I'll find out for So we've got um, Visit Isle of Wight. So we've got Will Miles. 
Yeah. 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 Hello, Will. It's uh... hi there. Um, I think it's still uh, held up a bit, and you're uh, and muted by the uh, by your controller. But hi, good evening from uh, East Cows. Um, how would you like me to present? I'm just going to present as to what we've done and uh, what we're going to do, and then I'll take any questions if that's how everyone wants to do that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK, no problem at all. Um, so it's been, uh, uh, as for everyone, it's been a very difficult time over the past uh, uh, almost uh, almost two years. And uh, in the last year, Visit Isla White uh, uh, and uh, alongside uh, our partners, we've worked uh, tirelessly and worked really hard to uh, get the information uh, out while well, during lockdown and during uh, times when uh, our promotion of the island was uh, uh, primarily um, uh, inward looking to uh, support the businesses. So obviously we've carried out lots of activities uh, to uh, signpost uh, businesses to various grants, uh, signpost information from government to uh, the industry and to the uh, uh, the businesses on the island, uh, whilst keeping a um, almost a, a low dial down of um, uh, uh, ensuring that uh, the, the, the marketing is, is still there, there so that we don't drop off the uh, off the map to everyone that's, uh, uh, that's, that's listening to us or seeing to us or, or love the island. So, over the last year, again, we we carried on and businesses were uh, uh, turning back on in and around May time uh, during uh, 2021. Uh, during all these periods, we carried out lots of uh, um, uh, pre-opening uh, sessions with the um, uh, with the industry, uh, ourselves visit England, the Chamber of Commerce and linked in with the various regulatory teams at Isle of Wight Council to deliver all of the correct messaging that would uh, that would be uh, allowing the businesses to reopen open and reopen safely. Carried out, uh, I think it was about 10 specific uh, sessions on Zoom, which uh, which were very industry focused. So all very information there for people to get out there. And um, during also that period as well, again, something that technically is not our remit, but ultimately, again, looking inwards, we created and delivered our Love Where You Live uh, campaign that we carried out across the island to ensure that people uh, were uh, getting out and enjoying when they couldn't go out elsewhere to ensure that they could see what was on the island because historically people don't look uh, inwards and uh, enjoy themselves on their own island or in their own locale so that's what we did with that and it was quite positive results that we got from there and again that was with the uh, support of uh, Isle of Wight Council. A lot of the messaging that went out uh, during that period of time was this one island message that we created. So it was uh, enabling us ready for the island is uh, the island is waiting, the island is ready, the island is opening. Uh, so these were the messages that the cross Solent ferry companies and again council chamber, all of these people would actually take on board and deliver. Um, Moving on to uh, uh, sort of the, the the rest of the year, we've done quite a lot of marketing in and around uh, uh, the various uh, target markets that we have, um, um, which has meant that we've we've used various different methods, including um, uh, Sky AdSmart, which is um, uh, a quite a, 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 an up and coming element to deal with uh, uh, getting. Um, our TV ads out to Sky customers across their various channels. And we've used that three times this year uh, for very, very um, uh, little money, uh, to believe it or not, uh, to actually be able to, uh, to get our message out there. And we've seen some, uh, again, some positive results getting that island message out and, uh, and promoting to the island. Um, on average, we would normally distribute 50,000 brochures in any, any given year. That's not happened at the moment due to obviously COVID when we've not been delivering or creating brochures because people have not been wanting to actually receive paper elements of it all. But with our um, uh, info box that, uh, that comes into uh, Visit Isle of Wight, we've continued to, de to deliver out digital elements and, and use the Visit Isle of Wight website as the main source of uh, um, uh, information. 
what we've seen from that website is that the page views have gone on the increase month after month after month. And uh, we're currently sitting looking at page views at the moment. Uh, I've just, I literally got the December uh, figures in today of uh, page views of over five, uh, 5 5.2 million page views in a given year. And we've not seen uh, any numbers like that since 2016. Um, so something clearly must have been going on in 2016 that uh, that was uh, uh, was giving lots of uh, returns. But we're seeing high numbers of page views and session times uh, uh, increasing as well to, uh, on average, uh, run about two minutes 20 in any session time that's there, which is quite a positive number um, as, you know, sometimes they can be small numbers, sometimes they can be large, but again, on that increase. Um, we're looking forward. We've done lots of lobbying over the past uh, over the past year. Certainly, lobbying with uh, our MP, lobbying at uh, DCMS, Cabinet Office, Bays, and uh, through uh, Visit England and uh, to, to the Solent Lep. All about the what's what needs to happen for industry and needs to happen to uh, support the businesses going forward and that tourism industry. Um, what we want to do is extend that season. We want to get more uh, knowledge uh, and, uh, and into uh, Visit Isle of Wight and into the tourism businesses that are there so that we can then uh, push uh, lots of different in, uh, um, messages out, relevant messages to ensure that we increase and have that economic impact coming to uh, the island. One of the ways that we, uh, one of the additional ways that we do that is through press and PR, and uh, we've uh, we've had quite a lot of successes over the over this past uh, uh, year getting various people here. Um, hopefully, uh, a lot of you saw the uh, the two days of. Uh, if you didn't, it's okay because it's a daytime show. Uh, but uh, we had uh, lots of uh, uh, we had the this morning program uh, and uh, loose women program on the island doing live uh, links from uh, the beaches in Sandown and in Ventnor, uh, which is a major uh, coup. We've worked quite hard to get that there, and that's uh, obviously one of the top daytime shows, which links into our target markets of uh, younger families and uh, and uh, 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 family family market. Um, Looking at the press and PR, we use a system uh, which is called uh, Trav Media, and Trav Media is uh, is uh, a system that gives people the options of uh, posting what they want to uh, uh, receive. So, if somebody wants to receive quirky uh, things about quirky uh, hotels in in a seaside location, then we're perfectly there to actually be able to fulfil and deliver these different elements. And our team look over travel media every single day, and that's what I would call a a, a reactive. Uh, side of it all. But in addition to that, we have our, our own lists of uh, journalists that we contact. And over this year as well, we've featured Daily Express, uh, On the Mirror, uh, Aberdeen, uh, Grampian uh, and, and newspapers, My London News, um, uh, the Hello magazine, um, uh, Plymouth Western Morning News, Bike Radar, uh, just to, to name but a few. So a lot of uh, very, very positive uh, 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 news stories that are there, and we continue to develop and get uh, more journalists to the island. We did struggle during the summer last year to actually get people here because the island was pretty full. The island, uh, we struggled to get accommodation for uh, for that journalist to actually come here and stay. So uh, we're uh, we're operating now to actually get our various things all booked in for the 2022 season. We're also currently working with a, a Channel 4 production company uh, about delivering uh, some uh, uh, TV programmes called Best of British by the Sea, bringing chefs across the island who would actually um, uh, be delivering, uh, using local produce and uh, uh, doing various different elements surrounding that as well. So these are some of the things that are ongoing with us. Um, what else has been going on? Well, obviously, we've uh, uh, the, we secured the, the funding of Visit Isle of Wight for the next five years through the uh, Island uh, uh, Business Improvement District uh, uh, process. So that will continue to allow us to uh, have our share of voice in what is arguably a very, very um, uh, uh, competitive marketplace, uh, a, a competitive domestic marketplace for uh, visitors and tourism coming forward. So that's been a, a positive element and uh, that will uh, we will develop uh, all of our plans uh, going forward into 2022. Um, 
some of the major elements that live alongside that is ensuring that we um, continue to uh, promote and deliver uh, the messages around the, the island being a UNESCO biosphere reserve uh, and uh, linking in with uh, the, uh, the the work that the AONB does as 50% of that walking, cycling uh, and, ex and experiencing the great outdoors, linking in with the various other themes. And uh, with that, um, coming alongside the sustainability messaging, looking for sustainable travel uh, and also the uh, accessibility messages that we want to get out there. Um, for those of you who perhaps don't know, the accessibility market uh, for travel in the UK is worth 12.9 billion pounds uh, in, in any given year. And uh, we want to how, develop how we can become that accessible aisle and uh, ensure that uh, we are open for all. Uh, because it's a very, very important element. Coming up also, we have uh, uh, in September time, we have Tour of Britain, um, which I feel is a major springboard uh, for uh, the delivery and uh, the people being able to see the island on that world stage. Uh, and uh, that's going to be uh, uh, transmitted live on uh, ITV4 uh, uh, across the period of time. So we're working close to actually getting that specific messaging and interacting with the teams at Alouette Council to uh, give our expertise as and when we're there. So, oh, just one other thing. Also, during October of this year, we ran the Alouette Walking Festival. Um, the Alouette Walking Festival went from the 9th to the 22nd of October. There were 107 walks across the island, and uh, uh, it went. To, uh, there was 1,683 walkers that came to the festival. 60% uh, of them were local islanders, which is very, very positive because it's getting people out doing all these various things. But equally, 39% of the people who attended that uh, the walking festival during that period were from off island and were here spending in the local community and having that economic impact that was there. Um, 54 walk leaders. Could we have done it without the help of the Ramblers? No, we couldn't, uh, but they were there to uh, support us and take us forward. And uh, as a direct result of that, we will look to um, uh, extend, again, talking about extending that season, about taking uh, the uh, walking festival to have two separate smaller events, one in May time and one in October time. So a spring and an autumn walking festival uh, for 2022, which is going back to how it used to be uh, many years ago before my time. Uh, so we'll look to actually deliver that uh, going forward. So any questions or anything else that you would like to know? Thank you ever so Thank much. You. Um, <laughs> Council award. Uh, thank you. Well, um, the business people, hoteliers um, in Sandown tell me that they had a really good year um, last year um, and obviously looking forward to similar this year as well. Do you think that the government's change in travel policy, and I'm, I'm talking about COVID, um, will undermine that in any significant way or do you think it might be too late for that? Do you mean the change in the international uh, travel policy? Yeah. Um, I think that um, uh, I, I believe quite strongly that 2022 will be a very strong uh, staycation market. There's still a lot of uh, uh, people who are out there who are, are don't want to perhaps go overseas. Um, Yes, they're making it easier to do that, which is with with with, with uh, taking away a lot of the testing elements. But I do think that it will still be a very very strong uh, market for 2022 uh, from the certainly from the domestic market. Thanks, Councillor Ward. Anybody else? Councillor Clerk, and then Councillor Clerk. Uh, your opinion on something. Uh, we've got different ideas about what might happen with Culver Parade. Uh, one is for a more um, artistic type of uh, uh, approach, uh, more cultural, and one is for a more um, fun type approach. Uh, when they established, they established the new uh, art gallery in Margate, there was considerable development of new hotel properties around it. 
Uh, do you think that that is, is, would be essential if we went with the cultural route? Because my feeling is those who go for the cultural uh, uh, challenge uh, are likely to be of a uh, more upmarket group than the hotels that are in Sandown uh, particularly cater for. And so there, there's, you know, if you go with that, that route, there are things that you have to do to your infrastructure. Uh, is that an issue in terms of how you would deliver that? Uh, Councillor Quirk, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question as to what you were referring to. You're refer you referring to, uh, I think you're referring to, is it Dinosaur Island Sandown? Okay. Um, I think that uh, you know th th there is something for everyone here on the island, and Margate is Margate is held up as uh, as something that's developed, and um, uh, it, it's. It, I thought the, the development of Margate is 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 certainly there, and it's and it is held up nationally as a, as a, as a development, as are places such as Ilford Coombe with Damien Hurst and all these different things as well. So I think that. Um, uh, there is something for everyone, and it, there's. Should it be? Should it be a cultural? Should it be? I think that's a very, very difficult one to do because the marketplace will actually um, uh, naturally sort of um, either go one way or go the other, and uh, and uh, depending on where that is. So, uh, excuse me if I sit on the fence ever so slightly on that one at the moment. Thank you, Miles. Councillor Medlin. Hello, Will. Uh, congratulations on the D-bid. I was very, very pleased to see that go through. Um, I've got two questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, one is really uh, in re relation to that election. Um, I picked up quite a lot of people who didn't really understand, a lot of your members who didn't really get it and were quite hostile. And I'm, I'm wondering what, if the if this Isle of Wight can actually do some more to show its own membership how they can benefit from Visit Isle of Wight and what it does. Perhaps there's some sort of PR thing to be done there, or maybe it's all about servicing or networking or being, you know, being more relevant. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. I appreciate that. So it's, uh, it's just one thought, if, if that's come across your mind. And the second one I want to ask you about is what your target mar markets are. Now, as you say, we've now got a very strong incoming market. So it allows you to be a bit more careful about who to target your budget towards you know and to, to, I'm thinking about people who are staying more than one night but maybe you know more short stays you, you mentioned the uh, shoulder months um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that that side of what you're doing thank you yes certainly um, the in relation to the bid and the and, and I think what you're talking about is the engagement side of it all more than anything is that uh, we, we we do recognize that uh, that engagement with the uh, the bid levy payers is crucial to ensuring that uh, we take this forward in a very positive way um, there is part of this that that I feel that uh, you know we will work harder you know we, we work as part as part of dbed every member uh, or every bid levy payer uh, is in, actually entitled to a page on uh, the visit Isle of Wight website and that we we go out and offer these to everyone not everybody takes that up which I find bizarre uh, in the in, in, in the, the, the main thing is because 60 plus percent of the of the bid levy payers are actually coming in at that entry level of 150 pounds so to pay that 150 pounds at that entry level and to actually get a, a a page on a website which can offer you um the ability to have pictures the ability to have video to to have all of these different things in there and you don't take it up i find quite uh, uh, quite strange but we will work harder we will hold more um, uh, engagement events with the people uh, with the bid levy payers to try and take that forward uh, because that is um, it's it's one of the things that I see as critical to what to what we do and how we get people to buy in and and and, and come along with us. On your second point about target markets, um, if you uh, if you if you saw or as I've seen our latest um, uh, uh, Sky Ad Smart TV ad, you'll notice that we actually uh, we're, we're we're looking at how we can actually bring that younger millennial market uh, to the island uh, uh, by uh, by using um, um, influencers and people who uh, are. are, are 
you want to see yourself in any in any video, yeah, but uh, um, uh, or any 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 TV ad. So we're looking at how we can bring these young millennials. Uh, in addition to that, uh, obviously the family market is, uh, and that the young family market is huge, uh, and, and and we certainly target that market as well. And as that out of season comes in there. It, it, it changes round. It, fl it flips round, and you then have for have people who don't uh, have the um, uh, the family ties, uh, so the ability to go out of school. So we, we certainly target uh, couples, younger couples, but also uh, um, uh, couples of ages such as myself and above. If I'm being quite nice about that, um, the older market, yeah, shall we say, um, and. Um, 57 what can i say that's uh, you know i'm 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 going up there um but uh, what i would say is that we 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 look at the target markets we look at where we're going and look at what we have to do to actually go down our, our total list of that i would have to give you a copy of our marketing plan because we have different uh, areas and different parts within that so happy to discuss that through with you uh, councillor medland at any time Um, Councillor Lilly. Thank you. Um, I have uh, three questions, right? So I'll do them <laughs> in um, in order so that you can uh, answer them back. Um, particularly pick, picking up from your your uh, presentation there. One is um, I want to bring up the issue. Obviously, in the last twelve months. Um, ride and going down to the bay area have been affected by travel one the the new train being put into place and and that taking longer than than we anticipated um and in ride we we're affected by a huge sinkhole which actually messed up our beaches for uh, in, the, in 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 that time and also with covid white link actually uh, still only operates to about 8.30 at night, which makes it very difficult for people to come over and to come back uh, within that. And also for part of the time um, uh, in the first lockdown, it actually wasn't there. So that did affect um, uh, uh, travel. So I want to know, how are you now seriously working with Southwest Trains and white white link hover and obviously red funnel and, and, and that and the other to make sure that the new train network and that the the area of travel from london that particularly to do with day trippers and things are really going to be hit next year by very effective marketing to actually come to the isle of Wight. that's my first question can I can I answer them individually if you don't mind? Because uh, there's quite there's quite a lot to that question, and uh, and, and I'll, I'll deal with that, and then you come on to the next one if that's okay. Okay, do you want me the next one? Well, the next one. No, no, I'll, I'll okay. Back to that now, if I may, yeah. So we we uh, I completely take your point, uh, uh, Councillor Lilly, on that one, and obviously we work really closely with uh, SWR. Um, we, we work closely with them on the island and also at, uh, at a head office level and uh, we, we interact with their marketing teams in London uh, regularly and uh, they actually work quite closely to ensure that the island is part of uh, any of the marketing that they are doing and we actually link in with elements that they carry out as well. So, for example, um, we have a very, very favourable rate of posters uh, costs that uh, SWR offer us at the various SWR stations en route, and we link in with that and also some of their email stuff that they do. Um, in relation to uh, White Link and Red Funnel and, uh, and Hover Travel, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of the Transport Infrastructure Board that, uh, uh, that, uh, that operates, and uh, the, the, the discussions are, are, are held there in relation to uh, the, the various elements of, uh, of their uh, operation. Uh, Marketing-wise and promotional-wise through um, uh, uh, White Link, Red Funnel, Hover Travel, 
we work so closely with them uh, so, uh, that we link up on different uh, uh, different uh, campaigns with them. You know, uh, Christmas time was doing some stuff with uh, Red Funnel. Uh, we just do got a campaign that's just about to go off with, uh, uh, with White Link uh, for um, uh, for that longer stay market and Hover Travel. We we work with them uh, regularly across the across the board. So we are there. We want it, we want everything to do. We we want it all to be a joined up because we only have. Um, six entry points onto the island so it's like having six gateways that's in there so we actually do work really hard with them to uh, uh, to do that in relation to them putting services on and taking services off i can't control that uh, you know they they are independent companies in their own right thank you um, thank, thank you your second question my second question i mean just on that particular point i think that we we do need to make strong noises because if you've got a service that finishes at 8 30 at night that's going to really affect or affect people coming uh to 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 us so we do do need to to tackle that um my second question is about working with parish and town councils uh it's a big part of the um alliance uh, uh corporate plan of of really developing that and if you look at, for instance, Ride, Ride has its own business development manager now. It has its own beach operations with deck chairs back on the beach uh, within that. How are you actually working with those town and parish councils? Because they are more and more going to be in charge of their, their future and, and, and how things are happening um, on, on the ground. OK, so uh, let me go back one stage and say that we are talking to uh, we urge the ferry companies to put on as many services as possible. Please don't think that we, we're not having these discussions with them, but ultimately it's their decision at the end of the day. But we are lobbying quite hard with them about their various uh, elements. However, going on to the next one, parish and town councils. We identified that, that, that we should be working more closely with the parish and town councils. Um, we've done some initial work, uh, um, I think, with yourselves, Councillor Lilly. I think we've we've spoken to you initially. Um, we had one meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we, we've started with that, but uh, we, we, we are putting everything in place, so we'll actually take that forward. And a very long time ago. Yeah, it is a long time ago, and we did have that. We did have the meeting, but we will have that again, and we we do have a plan to interact with the parish and town councils because ultimately, um, uh, DMO, which is uh, uh, which we which we are, we're a destination marketing organisation, but there also needs to be that destination management organisation and part of it as well, and that's linking in with you to ensure that the destination is. Uh, is fit for our um, uh, our visitors to actually come and and and, and enjoy themselves. So it's a work in progress, in short. Right. Uh, you mentioned about accessibility, uh, and I was very pleased to hear that within that that strategy. And I presume you're working with bodies like Isle, Isle Access that have done a lot of pioneering work uh, on the island about this. But for this to really happen, there really needs to be um, an assertive effort. For instance, our beaches are not accessible unless we actually put um, those special sand things down and access. There needs to be places to get, for instance, beach friendly wheelchairs and that. We need more changing places, uh, particularly in the seaside um, venues where at the moment, there are plans to have one in ride, but at the moment there isn't one in ride. So um, how are you going to work with the parish councils and Isle of Wight Council and to actually make this work? Because we've been talking about making Isle of Wight accessible for a lot of years. This is not new. And how are we going to make it happen now? Because I, your figures are right. It is a huge market and we could really develop uh, as an island. And that's something we'd want to do for our community anyway. So um, my ears pricked up and I wanna know where do we go from now and can we get action? Okay, um, yeah. Um, 
Obviously, we work with people like Isle Access, and uh, and Jan, uh, the chief exec, is uh, is a huge uh, um, uh, standard bearer for that, and we uh, uh, we 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 work with her quite closely. Uh, right here, right now, we're actually operating and we're, we're working alongside uh, uh, other uh, other sectors to look at how there's a development of uh, an accessible strategy uh, for the island. And those initial meetings have been going on over the past. Uh, three months uh, uh, with various different groups to actually get that together. And uh, I'm sure that uh, um, uh, I, I can see your director of Regen is, is in here. He can maybe update you if uh, if need be on that one, because uh, he's, uh, he's making that happen. Uh, so we're doing that through tourism, but it's not just tourism, it's all the various different other sectors as well for that, to have one overarching strategy for the island. I couldn't agree with you more that, uh, that there needs to be more change in places and more accessibility onto the beach. Uh, it's a case of getting that strategy in place and working that through as to how we actually make that happen. But we need the strategy in place first to be able to do that. Um, we've done some work with um, Tourism for All, which is a, uh, which is a, an organisation, a national organisation to uh, to support us and help us. We've also uh, uh, we we market and promote through uh, an organisation called Ewan's Guide, and Ewan's Guide is uh, a, a, a national sort of accessibility trip advisor type approach. So we work with them, and they actually feature on our website uh, as as a link through. Um, we've changed elements of our website to ensure that they are um, accessible for all. So, uh, for example, the uh, images that live on our website, we just used to put them on there with um, uh, the actual uh, number behind that, which was our our digital number for it. Whereas if people are actually using uh, uh, readers within there. The reader would come down, look at the picture, and actually just quote the number that was on there. So we've changed all of these uh, images around to actually have. So if it's a picture like the one behind me, a beautiful sun uh, sunset picture of the needles. That's what it says in the metadata behind the image, so that the e-readers and uh, so the readers can actually see that. And for people who are there, so we're changing that, change the font of our website, put the internet uh, the internationally recognised uh, link through for accessibility that's there. Uh, to ensure that that takes people to a page which shows the services and the businesses that are there that actually do that. So not not wishing to blow our own trumpet a little bit, we are doing quite a lot, but we could do more. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Um, Councillor Garrett, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first, uh, just picking up on what Councillor Lee talked about town and parish councils, I'd also say there is a one community council on, on, on the side of the as well. You put a charismatic community council and, and uh, we'll be delighted to obviously work with and, and build on the work of Visit Alified, particularly if we are successful in becoming a city council, which would be I, I'm sure Will you, you you would would see great advantages with within within that and you might want to comment on that. One other thing that I've noticed um in, in very, very recently was um this book that's coming out celebrating the hidden LGBTQ community that the Isle of Wight has had. And I know that Visit Isle of Wight has, has in the past been very supportive. For example, when Pride came to the Isle of Wight, uh, um, what, in 2017, it seems an age ago now. Um, in terms of a target market, do you see um, the, that sort of activity by others on the Isle of Wight, which are, are unveiling people who have otherwise been hidden to from being in the spotlight of, 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 of Isle of Wight community discussion and, and, and celebration. Do you see that as a means of sort of targeting particularly, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a cliched phrase, but the pink pound to bring people from the LGBTQ community to the Isle of Wight um, and explore our, our history from, from that community perspective. But of course, they will, of course, just enjoy everything else we have to offer as well. No, absolutely right, and 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 uh, please be assured that I will not forget the community council going forward. That they will they will live in and alongside parish and town councils with us. Um, in relation to uh, the, the, I think the book and the, the campaign you're referring to is the out, out on the island. I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yes, yes. Uh, right. Which uh, we were we we actually linked in with them to actually we and we we we, we delivered certain elements through our social media stuff. Uh, 
for that. Um, there is a part where uh, absolutely we, we want to uh, ensure that all of our imagery and anything that we're doing is, is inclusive to all. Yeah, we, we are an inclusive island, and that includes, uh, as a uh, age, uh, age, religion, uh, uh, creed, colour, whatever. And um, uh, so, certainly, we we will be looking at that, and we we're looking at how we can actually do that. And we're using um, uh, there's a there's a person at Portsmouth University who actually looks at uh, the imagery and looks at how uh, how we are. Um, ensuring that we're covering everything. Uh, uh, so we, we're taking that element. So yeah, the pink pound is certainly there. There's no doubt about it. It does it does live and breathe within the various different potentially uh, two income, uh, sorry, no kids, uh, dual income uh, markets that we look at uh, because uh, that can, uh, that's certainly there as well. But we, uh, we, we, we're looking quite closely at how we actually reference that and show that. So it's, it's all about inclusivity for all uh, uh, with, with us at the moment. Uh, and, and in the past, it has been awesome. Has that answered your question, Councillor Garrett? Um, on to uh, Julie jo Jones Evans, Councillor, and um, maybe Chris as well might want to. Yeah, no, th here. thank you for allowing me to um, to speak um, on, on this item, Chair. Thank you. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Miles will be applying to uh, visit England to claim the, the funding that we can do the city breaks for Newport and Carisbrook City from next summer. So yes, thumbs up for there. Um, so I just want to say sort of th thank you for that uh, for update. And and, and Councillor Lilly, um, so the Isle of Wight Council sits, we're board members of Office Isle of Wight. And also um, we have the Economic Development Board, the Executive Board, and uh, Mr. Miles is a member of that alongside the Chamber of Commerce and uh, the uh, Isle of Wight College and some other people as well. So that there's those co communications happening all the time. So rest assured that your, your, your question regarding um, the accessibility the tourism thing those that that that's that discussion is is happening so there's those conduits that are already there so um just want to sort of rest assured on that but of course it's it's for that, so kind of a door-to-door -door thing, isn't it, for accessibility? So we all need to take on board how we can, you know, how we can as individuals or as businesses and as town, town and parish community council, what we can do in our location as well. So it all sort of it brings it all together, doesn't it, that, that joint responsibility. Um, so I just wanted to say, so mention the Economic Development Board. If you recall, back in September, we had uh, the paper for the, the, the residual um, COVID grant money. Uh, you might recall there was various projects with, with that that we were going to do. That's all been put on hold. One of the projects that came out of that was um, about the tourist amb ambassador um, program. So having some training for babies, anyone who's going to com come into contact with a visitor. So be it someone who's serving you a pint, someone who's selling you a bus ticket, uh, someone who's, you know, meeting the hotel, your receptionist going, oh, where should I go tomorrow? Oh, you, how long are you here for? You know, yeah, you should want to go down to uh, wherever, you know, those sorts of conversations that we have all the time. So um, I said, so because we've had to put on hold because of the current COVID uh, situation, um, we did some preliminary work um, at end of end of last year, and uh, Mr. Miles is working with Tourism Southeast. And Tourism Southeast actually ten years ago had started working on a program they're going to deliver with the um, with the chamber. So it's a way we can revive that again, refresh it, and deliver it for this year. So I'm, I'm trying really hard. Um, to find some some funding where we can just make that happen. I think it's really important. No, you know, Councillor Ward, your point about the staycations, you know, it's going to be strong again this year, undoubtedly, because there's that uncertainty around COVID and people are going to want to know, I can definitely go to the Isle of Wight and have a fantastic holiday, or do I take a risk on going to going to Crete? You know, it's it's those things that people are weighing up and you, know, you, you need a holiday from what you've been through this year for sure. So I think, you know, we're going to try hard to, to try and um, find this funding and make, and make this happen. I think it's going to be really really important um, for this summer so to really give give that all-rounded customer service experience and say we're all ambassadors for our island aren't we so that, that's it for me sorry um the chair I just wanted to sort of just ch chip in there and it's quite interesting you you brought that up because I, I hadn't spoken to you about that before but I my question was actually about tourist information so that's kind of taking that that role and making everybody aware of what's going on which is brilliant Thank can, you. Can I just come back in before I finish, please, for two seconds? Absolutely. 
Um, just uh, uh, firstly, uh, thanks for that, uh, Councillor Jones Evans. Uh, when you said Mr. Miles, I had to look for my dad uh, because uh, there's not many people refer to me as that. So there you go. Um, but what I'd just like to say is that the, the, we we have to look. Uh, Many, many destination directors, such as uh, using that as myself, who promote places, they say, we have something for everyone. On the island, I suspect that I am the only person who within my peers can actually physically say, we have something here for everyone. And uh, this island is an amazing place. And, you know, if we look after it, the, the, the UNESCO biosphere status is something that we uh, should own, deliver, and use as our, um, uh, as our, our it's, it's almost like a golden thread that goes through absolutely everything that we should be doing. Um, there are only seven of them in the UK, and uh, any time when I uh, speak to people, these are the questions and these are the statements that I make in relation to saying, we are a UNESCO biosphere reserve, and that's what we should be using, and it should be living and breathing. Sustainability, one of the things picking up on Councillor Jones-Evans and what she said is that uh, when the people are saying, where do you want to go? For those of you who don't know, we actually run and operate a, um, a bus pass scheme that we actually use through the access fund. And that was the fact that we would give uh, accommodation providers uh, bus passes which were loaded up so that they, we could actually take car journeys off the road. Uh, and we had a hundred of these bus passes uh, over the past uh, three years. Uh, access, the access fund has come to an end now, but we've taken a commitment to actually continue that project on to ensure that we're taking actually cut car miles off the road. Plus, we're going to increase that to 500 passes to give to accommodation providers to say, OK, where are you going today? There's a bus pass. Why don't you take the bus? And, uh, uh, and uh, as the status says, drive less, see more and enjoy the island. And that's uh, just, I just wanted to get that one in uh, because I, I missed that out in my initial presentation. Thank you, Bill. Um, I just wanted to go back to when you said 50,000 brochures at the beginning of the conversation. And I, I would really like to have commitment that you're not going to be printing that many <laughs> brochures ever again. <laughs> <laughs> now um, we've gone, you know, and now people are really used to the digital age. There, there, there are, there is a, there is a market that comes to the Isle of Wight who still want to physically sit and uh, thumb through a brochure. There's no doubt about that. And uh, whilst uh, I, I absolutely could agree with you, if I could, if I could have stopped doing that brochure years ago, I would have done. But there was, uh, there was, a, there was a need for it at the time. However, COVID uh, has, has meant that we've not done this and I have no real intention of going back to actually creating a brochure uh, to actually do that. The website is our call to action and, and everything is there living on our website in that digital age and that's the way that we should be going. Wonderful, thank you ever so much. I just wanted to bring in um, Chris Ashman if he's got anything to say at all. Of course he doesn't have to if he doesn't want to. <laughs> Chris, are you there? I am, Chair. If you wanted you. to add anything about no, thank anything. You. Thank you, Chair. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, it was really interesting to hear the, the progress and achievements in what has been a really difficult period uh, for the tourism sector. Uh, the Visit Isle of Wight have been able to, to uh, facilitate and enable. I think that the one area which, which, um, which was touched on, but um, with particular interest to the wider economy, and it's an impact on the other, other sectors of the economy is obviously the skills and labour supply issues. And um, we, we, we did find ourselves in, in quite a tricky spot last summer um, as far as some of um, some of the particularly the food and beverage sector providers are concerned. And it really raised some fairly fundamental issues about the, the appeal of the sector to uh, certain segments of the labour market um, and needing to tackle some of those structural issues around skills and the image and identity of the, the tourism and hospitality sector on the island. And um, I think there's a lot of work to do on that. And obviously we don't have find ourselves in the same position next summer um, with having to run uh, additional campaigns. Whilst those work to some degree, um, I think we, we need to take a, a more strategic and structured approach to, to planning for those industry needs. Thank you. That's brilliant, um, Chris. We'll have to take a look at those in a bit more detail, I think, how we're going to approach that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Miles, for your time. It's Will, by the way. Oh, sorry. Will. Will. Oh, sorry. Will. Will. Right. I don't know what it is, but lots of people do that. It's OK, don't worry about it. Yeah, you should see what they call me. <laughs> but thank you very much. Okay, thank thank you. you. OK, um, unfortunately, we don't have the Solent LEP partnership. Um, we'll try and do that another time uh, on another agenda. So uh, number seven. So the speed limit review. Councillor Jordan, do you want to? speak on that or do you just want to take questions it's your bit now <laughs> should we go questions first and then okay so anybody want to go first Steve review Councillor Garrett thank you chair I'm struck with, with this I, I, I'm not sure this this document quite covers the scope of the review. I was, I was probably expecting a little bit more information, not on not, not stuff, but I'm not, I won't quibble. It's the new year and let's start in, in, in a pleasant mode. Um, what I was struck about was the way in which some of the speed limit review was uh, promoted by the fact that people have noticed that um, improvement of the island's roads has led to people driving faster. And I know that to be certainly the case um, in my own ward along Note Common and along Honey Hill. What, what concerns me is that what, how much of this was predictable um, and so could have been designed out at the time of the improvement of the roads. And if there is anything that can be done, obviously so much of the core investment period is, is, is done, but what can be done when further improving the roads to actually design out this problem in the, in the first place? And I'll give you an example. I, I've got a a uh, member of my community who is, is, is visually impaired and has experienced uh, people running the red light pedestrian crossing at the top of Honey Hill there on, on Parkers Road that runs through the subway to the college and other, other, other places. Had, had that surface been ramped, then it'd be a very strong discouragement to anybody running a red light be, because of the effect of their on their uh, suspension and other aspects of their vehicle. So what, I, what I'm looking at is, is do you think, do, does the cabinet member think there is a way of pro getting some any future schemes to properly look at this issue and design it out in the first place, even if it requires a little bit of extra money to make sure that, that, that whatever it is, a, a, a ramping element or a build out element or whatever that can actually just slow people people down so that they aren't tempted by the nice smooth first surface to, to discover just how how fast their vehicle can go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Garrett. Um, uh, let, let me try some of the things as best that I can. Um, Firstly, I guess, uh, to do it when, um, well, f well, firstly, uh, yes, two thirds of our roads have been improved, two thirds. So um, on those two thirds, we might have seen or have expected to see some increase in speed because of the quality of the, of the road. That, that means, um, there's still one third of the island's roads to be resurfaced, about 180 kilometres, 200 kilometres. Um, the very good news is that island roads don't seem to want to do any of those 180 kilometres of roads. Uh, so, so the first problem is, I guess, uh, they may never be done to incorporate a speed reduction scheme into them. That's the first thing. I'm not being trite, by the way, uh, Andrew. I'm trying to answer in the best way that I can. Um, on, on the others, yeah, you would have thought so. Of course, the, the simple answer is, as Ian will well know, is that all of those works fall outside the scope of the, of the PFI, so they, they would have a cost. And you will note that it's referred to in the very small update that you have in front of you, um, that the, um, the 250000 set aside it's not going to go very far. In fact, it could it could only deliver maybe two, three, or four schemes actually across the iron at best. Um, 
so uh, in the areas that, are, that have been resurfaced, and there's been a huge demand, again, uh, Ian will know this from his time, um, across the island. Uh, my colleague Julie here is constantly calling for 20 miles an hour everywhere across the island. Um, uh, uh, you know, we... <laughs> we <we're, laughs> yeah, she's not much. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, the, the kind of money that we're talking about is beyond the scope at the present time of the capability of this council to deliver. Um, so there is going to be, in any event, some serious priority decisions on which schemes we bring forward. And you, you well know what that's going to lead to, where some of us as councillors are going to be very pleased that we've carried out the speed review and allocated some money to deliver some kind of speed reduction scheme. And there's going to be many of us that are going to be mightily displeased that our, our particular area has been, it won't have been overlooked, but will not be yeah, prioritised enough to find the funding to deliver it. That's a financial reality. Um, I guess the other thing I'd say, again, not being trite, um, is, is that some of the, the calls for speed reductions come in areas where um, we're down to 30 mile an hour schemes already, sometimes 40, but sometimes 30. Uh, and and um, people want the braiding solution, 20 mile an hour in braiding, or um, I can't recall the, the other 20 mile an hour, but um, they want them. But of course, without enforcement uh, at the 30s, which is already encouraging people to demand a lower speed we can't keep the, the cars keeping to the speed limit as they are the police seem apart from the one occasional in fixed uh, spots where they do the um, the speed cameras uh, i'm not terribly interested in forcing uh, to the extent that we would need to enforce to ensure that we could actually re reduce the speed of some of the traffic. Um, yeah, that's my little notes that I've made, Councillor Garrett. I, it, it may sound convoluted and, and not satisfactory, but I guess we're back to our overall financial position in this council that is preventing us from delivering the things that we all want to deliver individually as councillors and as a council out into our community. We, we've just got to prioritise our money. Um, I, I, I fear that we won't be able to deliver all that we, we would hope to. I'm sorry that's probably not the, the best news that you want to hear. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Councillor Medland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Jordan. Um, I just want to re re emphasise a point that Councillor Garrett made. There is an extraordinary, I mean, I'm, I'm picking up in freshwater a great increasing demand for this, but people are finding it increasingly difficult to use large numbers of roads in, in the uh, peninsula West White, which are without footways and without verges and are often just narrowing to one carriageway uh, the all of these roads are becoming effectively too dangerous for people that's what i'm told and i've experienced it myself so i'm, I'm it's a very much a live issue and another th point i'd like to make i can understand the, the financial problems that we have and the lack of budget but uh, when we had the conference on the 20 mile an hour speeds and, and their introduction in newport about five years ago um it was interesting to see the evidence was quite compelling that the our severely high death rate on on our, on our roads would be affected the difference between 20 and 30 is fundamental in, in people being killed or not killed and I th and we know that most of our accidents are single car accidents they're caused by too much speed presumably they're not caused by other factors and the other point i just want to quickly make is that i think there are solutions i don't believe in things like hard engineering of roads i think that's actually a very detrimental thing to do and very expensive. I think we need to think more about using paint because you know, paint can create a psychological framework by creating the idea of narrowing lanes or reserved spaces or by putting lines across the road, as you may see on motorways, for example. But yeah, I think there is, there are potentially other solutions, but I do think we seriously need to be thinking about some reductions of 20 miles 
if we're going to encourage the cycling and walking that we say we are. It is one of our main strategic priorities. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> I didn't hear a question, so thank you. Oh, it's a very good comment. Thank you. So basically, he said, could you use some paint instead of... <laughs> <Open your eyes. laughs> I do kind of agree with you, but um, we do have visual imp impairment and stuff, you know, that maybe that causes an issue. I don't know, but it's certainly something to look at. I don't know as much as I, you I do, think. Uh, I, I think the answer is that um, there are numbers, there, there are, uh, there is not one solution to reduce uh, speeding traffic. That's absolutely clear. And um, some are more expensive than others. Build outs are quite uh, uh, effective. Um, and uh, but, but quite expensive. Uh, also, the um, the flashing lights that part that give your passing speed have, have, have delivered some some great uh, um, uh, e examples of how you can reduce traffic generally. But um, I, painting, I'd have I'd have to ask our experts up at Island Roads. I'm sure there's some highways regulations that stipulate what you can paint in which colour and where and how wide, and um, uh, it, particularly on our country lines. But uh, we, we're trying our best to deliver for the community as a whole, uh, John. And um, it's tough, as you know, as everyone knows. Uh, in, in the council to find the money that we want to deliver our services. We've got a few more people that want to speak, so it's going to be Councillor Quirk next, but uh, we are going to have updates, uh, Councillor Jordan, aren't we? As we go, as we, yeah. In October anyway, it's going to come back in October, OK? Um, it seems to be that there is a lot of local demand, and uh, yeah, certainly in, in Shanklin, We've got the uh, 20 mile an hour on the seafront, and that's absolutely appropriate. Uh, as you go through God's Hill, it's absolutely appropriate. Where uh, local communities want that, uh, shouldn't we allow the opportunity, if it's not going to be funded centrally, to the town and parish councils to, to say, we will fund this uh, and make that option. And possibly, uh, just to make sure that you've got local buy-in, actually make it go twice as far as doing it match funded with the local local town and parish council because that way they won't be asking for it if they don't really want it and it will go to places that you the greatest need hopefully because that will bubble out chair happy and uh, i did i have before i think ian may have done so to engage with town and parishes to see if they're able to take up the the majority funding of some of these schemes that they uh, for the most part, of asked for across the island, and there and there are many, many schemes asked for for speed reductions. They're beyond the uh, uh, they're beyond the scope of some of our town and parishes. But, but people at uh, Ryde and Newport Cowes, um, Shankly, may, uh, Sandown may be a very uh, wealthy uh, parish council. We <laughs> that might be able to uh, contribute. But uh, it, the principle, you, you, you're correct. The principle is correct. Why, if if a town uh, or a parish um, want to uh, improve their community in some way, such as speed reductions, if they're appropriate, and can fund those, it, why, why we there would be no reason we shouldn't talk to those town parish councils at all. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Councillor Quirk, is that, do you have any other questions? No. So, Councillor Lillie, your turn again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've only got one question, but I would like, first, first thing I would like to say is um, uh, I definitely have one road in my ward that um, is much better than two thirds done. It's actually three quarters done, and and cars really speed up at incredible speed, and then they hit the potholes at the bit, which is not done. Um, it's quite uh, crazy. In fact, I have another road which actually starts with potholes, then has smooth service, and ends with potholes. Um, so I, I, I completely do not understand the logic of, of, of how this happens. 
Well, my particular question is to do with actually how do we prioritise what I call the hot spots and the, the areas that really do worry me is near schools and because we most schools now don't have um, the, the, the traffic wardens that they uh, used to call them lollipop ladies in my day, they're probably uh, different now, but all of those, a lot of those have gone and um, except I think in Ride, Ride School, the private school still has one, right, which they pay for themselves, but all the state schools don't seem to, ha to have them now. Um, and these areas are, are the areas which actually um, a serious accident could happen. So how could we do, is there any intention to do a review, particularly with the schools, on the areas of road which actually um, are at high risk uh, of that? I have one which is Oakfield School in my ward, which is a nightmare. Um, uh, of that, I mean, it's an, a walking accident every every day uh, within that because there isn't proper crossings or people cross wrongly, you know, um, at, at different points. And there's a lot of schools on the island that are in a similar position as this. Hmm? So, so, so thank you, Michael. Um, I, I will get back to you Sorry. as a committee with the number of schools that have the temporary speed signs. I can't I can't recall the figure off the top, top of my head, but many schools have a temporary 20 mile an hour sign, that, like the signs I was telling you about, that come on at the, the drop off and uh, drop off and pick up times in the school. Not all schools. I'll get you the number and come back to you on that. Um, but the other the other comments are the same. Um, uh, you, even if you turned in front of Oakfield to 20 mile an hour, unless you have the police up there enforcing it, what, what's to stop people exceeding the speed limit? That, and that's the problem we have. Some people just won't respect our speed limits. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a huge frustration. Uh, and, and back to my other answer to uh, Andrew, um, it, with infinite resources, we could do build outs and find ways of making it very, very difficult in these hot spots of speeds and at dangerous points, particularly outside schools, um, uh, you know, to try and tam tamper it down. Uh, but uh, our money's not going to go through uh, across the iron, through all the schools and through all the the lovely resurfaced new roads where people are speeding. It's it's priorities. And, uh, it, that was the point I was making. What some of us are going to be very pleased when we finally deliver some speed reduction schemes, and some of us are going to be very displeased because we've been overlooked. I can't speak for your old Michael as much as I would like to. <laughs> it could be the logic of Island Roads is is you do part of the road and you have potholes at the end of it as as a informal way. <laughs> Of speed control. <laughs> it's a good thought. When when uh, the the other hotly asked for um, uh, requests from many councils to get their roads resurfaced and the potholes taken care of. So I guess we have to weigh up which it is. Do we want the roads repaired and the cars a bit faster, or do we want that? I'm being I'm being uh, cynical. We've got a few more people wanting to speak. So. We've got uh, Councillor Ellis next and then Councillor Garrett again. Okay. Again, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Dordan, as enforcement is a big issue and the police don't seem to want to particularly take that on board themselves. Um, I mean, for example, Godshill already has a 20 mile per hour limit, but I constantly am told that people are still exceeding that. The only thing that seemed to stop them exceeding that was when somebody put the dinosaur in the middle of the road some years ago, which was very effective, <laughs> very effective for my speaker troll. So flashing lights, we know, help people to slow down. Um, people jumping out into the road and asking them to slow down is also a very effective method, as you have seen me demonstrate. Um, what about education, a comms campaign? I mean, how expensive is it to, I know it isn't necessarily the job of the council, but people do take notice. I mean, all of the 
recycling, you know, around Christmas that went out there. I know people were talking about that, were thinking about it. Is there any merit in perhaps considering, you know, some sort of speed awareness type campaign? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. I, I, I'm glad to see you back. Um, uh, yeah, uh, why not? Uh, we, we can get some of our media out quite inexpensively, um, free, in fact. Uh, and um, it would just be a question of using a, some kind of awareness campaign. It's, it's a suggestion we can take on board, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. So, Councillor Garrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to the Cabinet Member for his pre previous response. Um, well, certainly, I agree with Councillor Ellis around the educational side of things. There is a change in public attitude, and, um, it, it, and so much of our discussion is always focused around the fact that we've allowed cars to go faster, and the cars are not the only users of our, our highways. Um, um, so, um, and, and I note, of course, that recently the, the, the MP and the leader of this council have written. Uh, in, in terms of the, the, the need for road policing unit on, on the Isle of Wight that can really be able to tackle the, the enforcement side of things. And I've had these discussions with, with the police around why, why they, they position themselves wherever so that the view is that the, the, the serial speeder is picked up somewhere, um, even if it's not necessarily on the road where, where they are also causing, causing a problem. Um, other thing that, that we might want to think about in terms of, of taking forward anything out of the speed review in terms of just putting in new speed limits is the fact that te technology is moving ahead. So I think from this year all, OK, the, the UK is not a member of the EU, but is quite likely to follow the EU on this. The technology that the speed limiter technology will be required on all new vehicles. Now, that can be overridden, but well, is a great way forward in terms of a, a, in ensuring that drivers who wish to be responsible and, and may make a mistake are actually held back by their own vehicle, that the speed limiting technology would do that. Based ar around, as I understand it, but I may be wrong, GPS signaling as to where the limits are. So if you put in a 20 mile an hour limit and your car is enabled in that way, it would be limited to, to 20 mile an hour. One thing I think though, coming for the role of this committee through to the report of the speed review is perhaps we have a role chair in which we can help the cabinet member refine the criteria for for that prioritization so it's not something that just appears magically out of uh, out of the bag at the end but actually has been well discussed within this council beforehand so those of us who will be very, very pleased, or those of us who will be very, very disappointed will at least know and have had a chance to influence the criteria by which those decisions will have been made. Um, so um, I, I perhaps, Chair, that might be something that we, we can we, we can think about between now and the report, which I think comes comes to us in October. Th th thank you, Andrew. Uh, I, absolutely. Um, I just refer you to page 15. Uh, of, of course, the speed review was carried out um, uh, within the Department of Transport's guidance and our own adopted speed limit policy. So there, there is a framework, but absolutely take your point and um, any help and assistance we can get to make our community a better place, I'm, I'm up for, Andrew. Absolutely. Thank you. It was actually uh, Councillor Julie jones Evans ex, but I'm going to go to Councillor Quirk that's on the committee and then to yourself, if that's OK. Uh, two comments rather than questions. Uh, the first is uh, when you put physical speed limitation devices in, beware the, uh, the law of unintended consequences. Um, where I lived before I came to the island, they, they put all sorts of little chicanes in, and that became uh, the fun test run for the <laughs> boy racers to get around the chicanes as fast as they could. Uh, and then they put some little curbs that come out into the uh, into the roads, and when it rained or snowed, uh, they became invisible, and you created excellent black spots that uh, uh, were never there before. And basically, safe roads became dangerous roads. So that, that's just one comment. And the other is in Shanklin, we pay for the 
patrol crossing people from the town council. So uh, there are other options of to do that if, if you think it's important, and we did think it was important. Like did, you, did you hear that? It was it was two, only comments. Two good but comments, I know. absolutely. Uh, what, what what I did, if I may, just add, and I forgot to add. Um, obviously, tech, technology is going to catch up very quickly on this. Uh, we don't have five G on the island, but that five G is possibly the the method uh, uh, the method of delivering those kinds of um, uh, that kind of technology out on our high street, uh, highways. Um, it, government uh, just recently. Uh, brought some legislation that that demonstrated they are changing their view on which priorities certain users of our highways have. If you're not aware of it, um, pedestrians and cyclists take precedent, for example, in terms of if there is a collision, particularly on a corner, uh, the law will look at the pedestrian and the cyclists having the right of way. Now, I can get into the detail of that, but it shows that there's already a moving recognition that, that there are more than just uh, motorised vehicles using our highways. And I, th I think we're, we're at the start of the journey, not, not the end. Thank you, Chair. That's brilliant. Um, Julie, um, th thank you, Chair, for in, in, indulging me. I'm just going to speak quickly. As some um, council medicine said, I've been I've been campaigning for this, and actually, I just did check the numbers. It's entering my tenth year of campaigning for 20 mile per hour in places where people live and work um, and learn. So, and I, th I think you know, Council, I think you're right. I think you know, England's going to be paying catch up soon. Already in Wales, they're looking at making it mandatory in these areas. Scotland, of course, all over Europe as well. Um, and other, other places, um, you know, because I think when, until you get to that point where it's actually in these areas where people are working and living and you know, residential streets, um, that, kind, that kind of town centres, the village centres, um, it's going to be really, really difficult. Each community then has to prove their point and find the funds and do all that. And it's much easier and cheaper to do it sort of en masse, really. And then, then you get the buy in because everyone understands what's happening. And, you know, driving through Godshill one minute, driving through Braden another minute. But I drive through Knighton, oh, I can speed up, jolly good time. You know, what, where's, where's the equality in that? And I think this is actually, it's, it's, an, it's an economic issue to make our, make our, our places where, where we've got businesses and our town and village centres, our, our seafronts, places where people can walk, walkable neighbourhoods that are safe and people can cycle and see and talk and, and hear and listen, you know, just, just be a, a community again. Um, it's also yeah, it's a public health issue because people can get out, cycle, walk, you know, and not not be um, isolated because uh, the, 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 there's too much traffic around. And it's an equality issue as well. By having 20 mile per hour, you actually that pound you're spending per head of population actually helps everybody. It helps it helps the, baby, the mothers with their prams. It helps the children that don't have a uh, find really difficult to dodge, dodge speeds. It helps helps our elderly, helps our disabled. It's it's a really really good tool to to level up. So I just think you know I think Councillor John, you're absolutely right. Um, once well, speeding at, at some point will be seen in the seen in the same vein as seatbelt wearing was in the past, as and dr as drink driving was. It will become the norm, the new norm that people don't speed and they they actually. Are aware of their surroundings and it makes it um, a pleasant place for people, everyone, to, everyone to be in. So I just wanted to, I, I could hold court for hours on it, but I just wanted to, my sort of question was, was don't forget the report that this previous previous version of this committee did. Uh, Councillor Quirk and I were on that at the time and we did some great work on 20 mile per hour and took some evidence from the police and from um, the uh, 20 mile per hour uh, Rod King, uh, MBA, MBA, who's been working um, on that for, for many, many years. So a bit of an inspirational character. So I just wanted to make sure that that, that piece of work wasn't lost with it with all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, any, any more questions? I think we'd, we're done with that subject now, I think. Everybody's, yep. Okay. So we're moving on to um, number eight, which is the uh, deployment of electric vehicle charging points in council car parks. It's kind of a no brainer for me, but um, <laughs> is that Councillor Jordan again? A bit tight questions. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. 
Councillor Quirk, you kick us off. Uh, this is the real sort of catch-22, isn't it? But uh, for people to go for electric vehicles, they need to be able to charge them and be confident they can charge them. And at present, there's the, the biggest reason for people not getting electric vehicles, apart from the costs, is the fact that they're apprehensive about getting stuck somewhere because they can't charge it. So we, we need to have uh, a, a programme that actually is ahead of the, the, the game in terms of supplying what we need. You need to have supply that people know they will be able to get. Uh, so uh, if, if we're going to get to a, uh, a carbon neutral island, we need to have electric cars. And therefore, we need to give the, create the confidence that if you get an electric car, you, you get down the other end of the island, you won't be stuck because it's uh, you've got to call the AI out to charge it up for you. Um, that, that's what we need. Uh, obviously, it costs and uh, it depends how, you are, how you're financing it, whether it's sort of third party financing or whatever. But um, we need to have a, a generous allocation of charging points on the island if we are going to encourage um, the uh, expansion of, of electric vehicles. And we should be uh, building it into our, uh, our planning policy that uh, all supermarkets uh, are required, if whenever they change their, any planning applications, they have to actually put uh, charging points in as they do in, uh, in London. I, I noticed uh, a brand in ride has got one in their car park now. If, if I may, Chair, yeah, there's there's a, an internet-based uh, website called Zap Map, and you will find that there are, I think, at the moment, 43 charging points on the island. Some in supermarkets, some are on on camps, uh, private holiday sites. But uh, but uh, what we are talking about is. Uh, absolutely right. We're, we're behind the curve, actually. Uh, um, other places are well ahead. We are being approached by private commercial companies who are offering um, quite interesting uh, uh, solutions to this at, at, at nil cost. Uh, presumably, they make the investment and their money for their investment is through selling the electric. Uh, and there's a whole range from that to us as a council actually finding sites and um, putting our own charges on. And it's up in between this whole range. Uh, in addition to that, we've had some grant funding for 10 on-road parking uh, charges, which have been installed. And our next phase is grant funding for uh, charges in our car parks, in, in council-owned car parks. So th th there are small numbers at the moment, but I suspect... Um, the commercial sector will pick up the mass uh, fast charging, just like the Braintree uh, model, which is a, a very quick, it's 14 kilowatts, I think, uh, and they build them with uh, refreshment areas and cafes, it's a bit like French uh, motorway service stations, uh, where people have uh, can shop even, there'll be shops, people shop, uh, eat, drink, uh, while their car's charging in about 20 minutes. Uh, and the the private markets seem to be keen to deliver that. We also had an interesting offer um, uh, for a number of car parks where they would use solar panels, so completely carbon neutral, uh, use solar panels to charge the charging points. So there, there are a number of solutions that are coming on board, but, but we're not ahead of the game by any means. We're on catch up. Councillor Ward. Just something to add. I'm, I'm, I fully, fully support this, um, this initiative. Um, like Phil says, we're, we're trying to catch up um, and doing this. I'd, I'd like to just raise something farther afield, and that's people wanting to have charging points like in their front garden, effectively parking spaces like that. Um, and at the moment, if you live in a conservation zone, you can't do that. Uh, and that's something we have to look at. You know, it's all very well having these theoretical things, but we live in a practical world uh, and people want practical things. So I do believe our planning policy needs to be looked at um, and you know, people accommodated who want to do this. I did bring this up at a conservation meeting 
Um, and, and the officer there, I said, right, OK, so if I knock my front wall down and put a charging uh, bay in, what are you going to do? And he went, well, I don't know, turn a blind eye. But actually, you know, we, we need to have a policy on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks for that, Ian. Um, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'll take that away. Thank you. Um, we, we will work with planning and see. I'm not suggesting I could do anything that you couldn't do, Ian, but we'll certainly uh, try and make changes. It's absolutely imperative that we deliver this. So thank you for that. So I actually have a resident who's trying to do the same thing, but Arnhem Rose won't allow them to change their front bit so they can't get the car that they want to be able to change electric. Councillor Lilly. Just coming on the back of, of, of this, um, I think that we do need to look at the, the, the planning side and actually really accelerate this. Um, as chair of planning, and I know Councillor Quirk was also chair of planning um, before me, and most of the planning applications of housing and that don't often have anything to do with solar don't have anything to do with renewable energy um, and don't have anything to do with electric cars. We, 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 uh, the developers and things need to be educated to actually, you know, get into the world. I mean, we're looking at uh, penny feathers at the moment, the thing. They're still actually proposing to put gas central heating in there. You know, I mean, it, it, uh, we, we, we are sort of behind the times. And I think if we can put a message from this committee to actually uh, say, because we're a policy and scrutiny committee, that actually they really does need to um, put within policy the whole green agenda on, on things like cars, because things are moving so fast in technology. I mean, we now have storage that there is now the technology to have storage of, of, of that. A house could be built to have all the storage it needs to use, for instance, solar energy of, of that. There's also the technology that you plug your car in and your car actually can put energy back in, right? And, and, and that. And, and we don't seem to be, I'm definitely as chair of planning, not seeing applications which are in the 21st century. And, and, and we really need to sort of um, start, perhaps, bringing people onto the island and develop, because there are developers in the mainland who are doing really innovative things. We, we need to get another grade of people uh, from the business community that are actually really being dynamic in this particular area. And I'll, I'll, I raised it at a meeting, I'll raise it up, you know, that one of the the heads of uh, the to do with electric and cars, which is a national organisation, Senec. The CEO is a ride boy or ride man, right? Keith Budden comes from ride. He has come on holiday here for years to try and get his expertise onto this island, and it just hasn't happened. I gave that to, to Councillor Jarman today as a cabinet member looking at this to get this. We've actually got people on this island, expertise, that actually could really, really bring this along, and we're not using them. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Shall we bring it back on point to the car parks? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I was going to say, uh, absolutely, we, we, we just need to engage with, with the planning uh, through my colleague, uh, Councillor Fuller. Uh, we've done it in the past on car parking requirements on new builds, going to two, two cars per, per, per dwelling. It seems to me that it would be a fairly simple uh, addition to planning requirements to uh, have a dual charging point on every new property, but it's not really my area and I'm happy to drive forward with it from our perspective of transport and the infrastructure but we need planning on board with that it's it's absolutely right though Michael I think we should probably bring that through planning with with Paul and stuff so um can I say that are you sorry Councillor Garrett so, uh, so 
is is the model here that it's park and charge? So you you, you turn up and you go you go away and you charge because of course uh, that's a very different model to the current way in which we charge our cars. Those of us who still have uh, unfortunately fossil fuel ones in which we turn up and we fuel and we go. Um, so the model at the moment is is looking at park and charge, but as fast charging technology improves will there be scope to move to a charge only model so people would know where they could go charge for 10 minutes which might be kind of reasonably the, the longest period of time a person might be ex expect to wait before they get to go onto a charger or whatever because what we ideally would like to see of course is that technology gets us to the point where where charging an electric vehicle is as convenient and as quick as it is to charge uh, as in put fuel into a fossil fuel vehicle. Um, and it has always struck me because under that model, of course, you don't actually need many charging points. Um, how many petrol stations are there actually on the island compared to electric charging points already? We're probably at a point where the, the numbers are, are, are quite surprisingly unbalanced in, in, in some way. Um, so it, park and charge, but moving towards the potential for charge only stations is, is that the, the idea uh, yeah thank you andrew um I, I, just, I, I tried to explain i think there'll be a mixture i think um people will want chargers at home where possible with particularly if that comes at an affordable cost um, where you charge overnight i think we are quite lucky living on an island in that our mileage is can be reduced for lots of us and uh, I'm hearing uh, ranges of electric cars might last the average person uh, resident on our island uh, perhaps four or five days of driving uh, so you're right that probably numbers uh, 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 numbers of actually charging points will not be extensive um, and it looks like the commercial sector will will try and deliver those fast charging points like Braintree. I, I've mentioned Braintree. It's it's an example. If you want to go and look at it, it's uh, it, it's uh, I, I think it's 14 kilowatts. It's a fast charger and I think it's about 10 minutes for a full charge. Um, but they build it into a bit of an experience. I know it's not a full, you know, a full tank speed, two minutes, uh, but they build a coffee shop and, and shopping, and they it's it's being sold as a kind of experience. But, but go look at Braintree and see how it works. Those sorts of companies are approaching us on the island to, de to deliver that. The problem will be is finding the sites that they want to put uh, their, their fairly heavy investment into. They, they want main roads uh, in main areas in Newport, and it's tough to... Well, we, we've got a lovely site with two green fields at the start... At the start... <laughs> At the start of uh, on Fairley Road, which um, we tried to build houses on at one time, and we refused to do that. Um, but it's been identified as a possibly the best spot on the island for a fast charging unit, and it's coming up against some resistance, if I if I can put it that way. Anyway, there we are. I, I think it'll be both, Andrew. It will be home chargers. There'll be on street. There'll be car parking. Char I think the on street and the car parking won't will never be fast chargers. They may be two or three hours. But but I suppose the analogy will be not everyone fills their tank up. They maybe put twenty pound of petrol in. So you may put a a, a half hour uh, or an hour's charge that may you know get you fifty miles or something like that. I guess it's a new thing that we've all got. I haven't got an electric car myself yet, but I've been in a couple and they're quite impressive. But um, I think there is a ch there will be a change in how we use our vehicles. I'm not sure quite how yet, but thank you for that, Andrew. Okay, I think it's the general consensus, is it, that we support? Yeah. So thank you, Councillor Jordan, for... For that, so uh, the next one is number nine, the work plan. So uh, to consider the draft work plan and identify any additional topics, etc. Does everybody have a look at it? I think it's looking pretty good. Myself. Has anybody got any other topics they'd like added at all? No, we're all happy with it. Brilliant. I should turn back to the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, members' question time. I know we've got one question. Um, I think you've got it on your. I've certainly got one. I think everybody else. I've just got it. So, would, are you wanting to read yours or? Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, you you yeah. read yours and then um, Councillor okay. Baker will respond. Thank you, Karen. I think everybody would agree that Sandown is badly in need of significant uh, regeneration, and it should be a priority for this council. I do see this as a regeneration issue. To my dismay, this independent-led administration agreed to remove a potential multi-million pound investment for the Dinosaur Isle location and move it elsewhere. I know that officers have been asked to look for a new location for Dinosaur Isle. So to agree to move Dinosaur Isle from Sandown, I can only conclude that you already know what you're going to put on that site. Otherwise, this was an irresponsible decision. So my question is, if you, will you please tell me which agencies, companies, individuals or other bodies with whom you have been or intend to discuss, negotiate an alternative attraction and what specific... Thank you, Councillor Lord. Councillor Bacon. Sorry, there we go. There is a, a written answer I hope has been put in front of you. It doesn't look, well, I'm sure. I, I will read it anyway, as, he, as you've read out the question. Um, just in introduction, I would say, I think we agree about Sandown, um, but I think, Ian, in the rest of the question, you're conflating Dinosaur Isle and Dinosauria, um, and that they're, they're in the error lies. Officers are looking for locations for Dinosauria. Um, I mean, if I come to the written answer, it is this, the proposed theme park would have not fitted in the proposed location. When the independent administration took over, it found out that discussion had moved to, to taking over the Brown site in addition to the Dinosaur Isle location. However, even aside from the fact that the destruction of Browns is unacceptable to the current administration, it is also now clear that there would still not be enough space for the proposed attraction on the area that was being looked at by the Conservative administration. The Alliance is in active discussion with Dinosauria to look for an appropriate and viable location for them on the island. The precise options in terms of physical area cannot be discussed publicly at the moment but include options in the bay area the potential attraction is of a scale and importance that would be a benefit to the whole island so it is not appropriate to risk losing it by concentrating on a specific location where for whatever reason it simply would not fit in respect of Sandown and the surrounding area, we are looking at the Biosphere and the Bay project, which was originally commenced in early 2020, but is now being relaunched. It was obviously held up by COVID. The current conception is for elements of the Culver Parade area to form part of the Biosphere and the Bay project. This may still involve Dinosaur Isle or a similar or additional attraction to it using the existing building or its footprint. At the moment, there is no agreement to move Dinosaur Isle, as the question assumes. Indeed, the leader has given a personal undertaking to the staff and management of Dinosaur Isle that it will remain where it is for at least three years while the other projects referred to are developed. The vision for the Biosphere and the Bay project includes making the Culver Parade area more attractive vis to visitors interested in the area's unique landscape, wildlife and history and attracting a greater share of the increasing ecotourism sector. The ward member is being kept fully informed as things progress forward. So I, I, I would just summarise that is the written response, but Dinosaur Isle is not moving and will remain there, um, as I say, for at least three years. If the collection it currently houses moves to Dinosauria, then an alternative attraction will take its place and that I envisage as being part of the biosphere in the Bay project. That is a massive project that's coming forward. It covers from Culver down all the way across to Ventnor. Um, and as part of that, it's going to be launched publicly. And I'm sure you, Ian, as a member in the area covered, will get an invite to that launch and be able to be part of what is going forward. Uh, Councillor Bacon, thank you for your answer, but you didn't quite answer my question. I want to know who you're talking to. 
OK, there are all sorts of rumours going around in Sandown. Um, there's talks of, you know, uh, brown envelopes, ha handshakes, all this sort of stuff. Well, I want to know who you're talking to, because then I can say well, that's not true. Um, as much as I respect you, Councillor Lord, we've had the question and we've had the answer. Well, okay. I, I would say we are talking to Dinosauria. And you say I'm talking about dinosaur oil. You know they are one of the same thing. Thank you. Very much they are not. Oh, for goodness sake, Ian. Dinosaur Isle is a council-owned attraction that is currently open. Dinosauria is a German-owned theme park company. They are not I, the same thing. just say at the end of one of the last meetings, not mine, and wasn't it agreed that Councillor Ward could speak to you at any any point? Yeah, so can we... Have, have you approached Councillor Bacon? OK, so we're, we're, we we'll initiate that. Yeah, I, I said that I would approach. I said I would approach Councillor Ward during January when I had some more news. He has brought forward a public question, so this is what I would have been telling you. Okay, so well, read the now. answer, Happy please. Happy New Year, and well, hopefully you'll start that conversation between each. Councillor. Just, um, yeah, Chair, if, if, there were any, if there were any more questions from your committee, I just wonder if I could permit to say two things to the committee as a way of an update from Regen. But I'll, I'll just, I'll see. Yeah, that. it's members' question time now. In fact, I, I, I know we did visit Isle of Wight, but I don't know why we didn't have a Regen update, but we'll make sure we got one next time. Because yeah, there's an important date, I think, if you If you'd with... like to email the committee with an update, that would be brilliant. May I, in, yeah, that's OK. There's an important yeah. date that I think people might be interested in. That okay. would be great. If we have an update on email, that's wonderful. Thank you. So um, that's the end of the meeting now. And then we're back again in May.